All such cottages look neat and substantial at first, their massive brick walls deceive the eye, and, on passing through a newly built workingman street, without remembering the back alleys and the construction of the houses themselves, one is inclined to agree with the assertion of the liberal manufacturers, that the working population is nowhere so well housed as in England. But on closer examination, it becomes evident, that the walls of these cottages are as thin as it is possible to make them. The outer walls, those of the cellar, which bear the weight of the ground floor and roof, are one whole brick thick at most, the bricks lying with their long sides touching, but I have seen many a cottage of the same height, some in process of building, whose outer walls were, but one half brick thick, the bricks lying not sidewise but lengthwise, their narrow ends touching. The object of this is to spare material, but there is also another reason for it, namely, the fact that the contractors never own the land but lease it, according to the English custom, for 20, 30, 40, 50, or 99 years, at the expiration of which time it falls, with everything upon it, back into the possession of the original holder, who pays nothing in return for improvements upon it. The improvements are therefore so calculated by the lessee as to be worth as little as possible at the expiration of the stipulated term. And as such cottages are often built, but twenty or thirty years before the expiration of the term, it may easily be imagined, that the contractors make no unnecessary expenditures upon them. Moreover, these contractors, usually carpenters and builders, or manufacturers, spend little or nothing in repairs, partly to avoid diminishing their rent receipts, and partly in view of the approaching surrender of the improvement to the landowner, while in consequence of commercial crises and the loss of work that follows them. Whole streets often stand empty, the cottages falling rapidly into ruin and uninhabitableness. It is calculated in general that working men's cottages last only 40 years on the average. This sounds strangely enough when one sees the beautiful massive walls of newly built ones, which seem to give promise of lasting a couple of centuries, but the fact remains, that the niggardliness of the original expenditure, the neglect of all repairs, the frequent periods of emptiness, the constant change of inhabitants, and the destruction carried on by the dwellers during the final ten years, usually Irish families who do not hesitate to use the wooden portions for firewood, all this, taken together, accomplishes the complete ruin of the cottages by the end of forty years. Hence it comes that Ancoats, built chiefly since the sudden growth of manufacture, chiefly indeed within the present century, contains a vast number of ruinous houses, most of them being, in fact, in the last stages of inhabitableness. I will not dwell upon the amount of capital thus wasted, the small additional expenditure upon the original improvement, and upon repairs, which would suffice to keep this whole district clean, decent, and inhabitable for years together. I have to deal here with the state of the houses and their inhabitants, and it must be admitted, that no more injurious and demoralizing method of housing the workers has yet been discovered than precisely this. The working man is constrained to occupy such ruinous dwellings, because he cannot pay for others, and because there are no others in the vicinity of his mill, perhaps too, because they belong to the employer, who engages him only on condition of his taking such a cottage. The calculation with reference to the forty years duration of the cottages, of course, not always perfectly strict. For, if the dwellings are in a thickly built up portion of the town, and there is a good prospect of finding steady occupants for them, while the ground rent is high, the contractors do a little something to keep the cottages inhabitable after the expiration of the forty years. They never do anything more, however, than is absolutely unavoidable, and the dwellings so repaired, are the worst of all. Occasionally when an epidemic threatens, the otherwise sleepy conscience of the sanitary police is a little stirred, raids are made into the working men's districts, whole rows of cellars and cottages are closed, as happened in the case of several lanes near Oldham Road, but this does not last long the condemned cottages soon find occupants again, the owners are much better off by letting them, and the sanitary police won't come again. So soon. These east and northeast sides of Manchester are the only ones on which the bourgeoisie has not built, because ten or eleven months of the year the west and southwest wind drives the smoke of all the factories hither, and that the working people alone may breathe. Southward from Great Ancoat Street, lies a great, straggling, workingman's quarter, a hilly, barren stretch of land, occupied by detached, irregularly built rows of houses or squares. Between these, empty building lots, uneven, clayey, without grass and scarcely passable in wet weather. The cottages are all filthy and old, and recall the new town to mind. 
the stretch cut through by the Birmingham Railway is the most thickly built up and the worst. Here flows the Medlock with countless windings through a valley, which is, in places, on a level with the Valley of the Irk. Along both sides of the stream, which is coal black, stagnant and foul, stretches a broad belt of factories and working men's dwellings, the latter all in the worst condition. The bank is chiefly declivitious, and is built over to the water's edge, just as we saw along the Irk, while the houses are equally bad, whether built on the Manchester side or in Outwick, Calton, or Hume. But the most horrible spot, if I should describe all the separate spots in detail I should never come to the end lies on the Manchester side, immediately southwest of Oxford Road, and is known as Little Island. In a rather deep hole, in a curve of the Medlock, and surrounded on all four sides by tall factories and high embankments, covered with buildings, stand two groups of about 200 cottages, built chiefly back to back, in which live about 4,000 human beings, most of them Irish. The cottages are old, dirty, and of the smallest sort, the streets uneven, fallen into ruts, and in part without drains or pavement, masses of refuse, awful and sickening filth lie among standing pools in all directions, the atmosphere is poisoned by the effluvia from these, and laden and darkened by the smoke of a dozen tall factory chimneys. A horde of ragged women and children swarm about here, as filthy as the swine, that thrive upon the garbage heaps, and in the puddles. In short, the whole rookery furnishes such a hateful and repulsive spectacle as can hardly be equalled in the worst court on the Irk. The race that lives in these ruinous cottages, behind broken windows, mended with oil skin, sprung doors, and rotten oar posts, or in dark, wet cellars, in measureless filth and stench, in this atmosphere penned in, as if for the purpose, this race must really have reached the lowest stage of humanity. This is the impression and the line of thought which the exterior of this district forces upon the beholder. But what must one think, when he hears that in each of these pens, containing at most two rooms, a garret and perhaps a cellar, on the average twenty human beings live, that in the whole region, for each one hundred and twenty persons, one usually inaccessible privy is provided, and that in spite of all the preachings of the physicians, in spite of the excitement into which the cholera epidemic plunged the sanitary police by reason of the condition, of Little Island, in spite of everything, in this year of grace 1844, it is in almost the same state as in 1831. Dr. K asserts that not only the cellars, but the first floors of all the houses in this district are damp, that a number of cellars once filled up with earth, have now been emptied, and are occupied once more by Irish people, that in one cellar the water constantly wells up through a hole stopped with clay, the cellar lying below the river level, so that its occupant, a handloom weaver, had to bail out the water from his dwelling every morning and pour it into the street. Farther down, on the left side of the Medlock, lies Hume, which, properly speaking, is one great working people's district, the condition of which coincides almost exactly with that of Ancoats, the more thickly built up regions chiefly bad and approaching ruin, the less populous of more modern structure, but generally sunken filth. On the other side of the Medlock, in Manchester proper, lies a second great working men's district which stretches on both sides of Dean's Gate as far as the business quarter, and in certain parts rivals the old town. Especially in the immediate vicinity of the business quarter, between Bridge and Key Streets, Princess, and Peter Streets, the crowded construction exceeds in places the narrowest courts of the old town. Here along narrow lanes between which run contracted, crooked courts and passages, the entrances to which are so irregular, that the explorer is caught in a blind alley at every few steps, or comes out where he least expects to, unless he knows every court, and every alley exactly and separately. According to Dr. K, the most demoralized class of all Manchester lived in these ruinous and filthy districts, people whose occupations are thieving and prostitution, and, to all appearance, his assertion is still true at the present moment. When the sanitary police made its expedition hither in 1831, it found the uncleanness as great as in Little Island, or along the Irk, that it is not much better today, I can testify, and among other items, they found in Parliament Street for 380 persons, and in Parliament Passage for 30 thickly populated houses, but a single privy. If we cross the Iwill to Salford, we find on a peninsula formed by the river, a town of 80,000 inhabitants, which, properly speaking, is one large working men's quarter, penetrated by a single wide avenue. 
Salford, once more important than Manchester, was then the leading town of the surrounding district to which it still gives its name, Salford Hundred. Hence it is that an old, and therefore very unwholesome, dirty, and ruinous locality is to be found here, lying opposite the old church of 